Kathy Ramsberger, author of ShoresOfOurSouls.com and author of the, of the novel too. And you can find me at ShoresOfOurSouls.com or GroundOneCoaching.com. Uh, and today we have a very special guest, um, Agent Diane S. Nine, who's the longtime president of Nine Speakers, a 32-year-old full-service entertainment in, in agency representing people from across the globe. Her agency's full-service menu includes the literary, lecture, theatrical, film, and television arenas. She recently published her own book, My Life with Helen, featuring her memories of journalist and renowned and famous White House correspondent, Helen Thomas, a real trailblazer for most women journalists. Uh, we have a lot of, a lot we owe her. And her life establishing an agency as a young woman in Washington, D.C. Diane is a graduate of the Cranbrook School, Denison University, and George Washington University Law School. I also want to remind viewers about Helen Thomas herself. A uh, really short bio, uh, Helen was an Arab American who uh, was born in, in Michigan and attended Detroit's Eastern High School and Wayne State University, racking up a slew of firsts as a female journalist. She was the first female officer of the National Press Club, the first woman officer and later president of the White House Correspondents Association, and in 1976, she was named one of the world's, the World Almanac's 25 most influential people, women, people in America. She covered every president from JFK to Obama. What a legacy she leaves. And Diane had a front row seat to most of it. She was uh, a family friend as well as, as representing her. Um, she, she knew her from her own childhood and Diane's book contains an insider's view into DC's political and media scene as well as an insight into both Helen and Diane's life stories. It's a very personal story uh, and uh, I am so pleased to welcome Diane Nine to Facebook Live. Before this I want to say that the show went on in spite of some technical difficulties and Diane was gracious enough to come even though she's having to phone in. So you won't see her, um, you'll only see me, but she's going to be here to answer our questions and to give us uh, a little bit of a taste of her own writing. So I'd like to uh, show Diane's book. And, and Diane, you want to say hello? Hello, thank you for having me. And I wanted to mention that this is a particularly pertinent week to be talking about Helen Thomas, since Monday was the anniversary of her death seven years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can sort of feel her with us. Because it, it, I was very lucky enough to meet her very quickly once, and uh, I sort of feel that right now. So, so as you can tell from the cover, which says it all, um, Diane and Helen were very close, and uh, that's obviously in D.C. in front of the White House. Um, so I'd like to read from a little excerpt and then we'll talk to Diane herself about some of the stories. Okay. So these stories are just sometimes even zany and this one's a really funny one that shows both Helen's incredible professionalism but it also show, shows her personal side um, and I will start with that. When, when there weren't security issues to worry about, there were always other issues of concern. Sometimes these issues were unbelievably perplexing, like a trip to New York for Helen to appear on ABC's Good Morning America. Helen and I, and that means Diane, 
we're, uh, we're planning on going up to New York for her to do the show when a friend decided to join us because we had to be at their studio early in the morning. We traveled the day before early enough to eat dinner at the Big Apple. We checked into a lovely two bedroom suite at our hotel. Our friends traveling with us agreed to share a room with me and Helen would have her own room. After surveying our suite, we grabbed a cab and headed to the agreed upon restaurant, a recommendation by people we knew living in New York. Upon entering the restaurant, Helen was immediately recognized by the owner as I'm sure she was anywhere she went. He began fawning all over Helen, offering to serve his best dishes. We were stuffed, but the meal was not complete without dessert. The owner brought to our table a lazy Susan turntable loaded with one of each of the desserts on the menu. We had fun spinning the turntable and trying a bite of everything. Somewhere in the middle of our dessert tasting, Helen Mallet managed to get various food particles all over the dress she wore, including a long stain of chocolate fudge. She was a mess, but nobody cared and Helen didn't seem to notice. Um, we went back to our hotel and fell into bed, feeling more than satisfied. The following morning, our friend went into our suite's kitchen with Helen to make coffee while I tried to grab five more minutes of shot eye. I still must have been tired since I dozed off again. Um, there, it's, it's, Helen, I know from this book, was notorious for um, starting very early on anything. Um, I woke to my friend shaking me. She was frantically whispering something, but I couldn't quite make out what she was saying in my grogginess. I asked her to repeat herself. In a barely audible whisper, so as not to let Helen hear, she explained, Helen is, Helen is wearing the dress from last night. Not recalling the chocolate stains, I re responded, so? My friend said, you can't let her go on national TV with that huge chocolate stain. Get up and tell her to wear something different now. I jumped out of bed and went into the living room. Helen was sitting there reading a newspaper, drinking coffee, and wearing the stained dress. In as chipper a voice that I could muster, I asked, so, what are you going to wear for GMA? Helen looked up. I thought I'd wear this. In my most delicate tone, I said, you can't wear a dress with a huge chocolate stain on TV. What else did you bring? My heart sank when Helen told me she did not bring anything else. At that point, we were only about an hour away from being picked up. She was of that generation um, that, that packed light. Um, our friend emerged from the bedroom. We looked at each other and she mouthed the words, who forgets clothes when they're going to be on TV? Helen continued reading her newspaper as though she didn't have a care in the world, but finally offered, I have a sweater with me. I asked to see it. We shoved Helen's arms into the sweater, buttoning it up to the top to cover the chocolate mess and some other food particles from our dessert the night, the previous night. She looked a little silly, but it was certainly a better look than the sweater hid than what the sweater hid. So that's a funny story. There are also some amazingly tense moments uh, on, the, on the speaking circuit and also a very personal viewpoint of um, the real Helen Thomas. Um, but first, before we get into that, Diane, I'd like to touch on some of the moments in your equally amazing career. Uh, can you tell us about some of the people you've worked for? I know you came to DC to intern for President Carter, um, and I'd love to hear about that, and so would we all. <laughs> well, first of all, I think that Helen and my parents believed I would be a professional intern when I was young. Um, <laughs> You know, I came to D.C., I interned in the Carter White House, which was a blast, and then Carter lost, and there went my summer job. So, but I, I was um, bound and determined to come back to D.C., so I eventually interned for both then Michigan Senators, CNN and the Washington Bureau in its infancy, and UPI, actually, one summer where Helen was the White House Bureau Chief. She was my boss when I rotated to the White House. That didn't work out so well. But at any rate, um, then um, because, of course, Fritz Mondale was vice president when Carter was president, I was asked when Mondale was going to run for president to be a press secretary on the ill-fated 1984 presidential campaign. Um, but I accepted. I actually took a year off between undergrad 
in law school in order to do the campaign gig. And um, while I was in law school, um, I obviously got to know all of these people very well that were what I call those Washington people. And some of them came to me with what I was calling their cruddy little legal problems. So I eventually went to a professor, and I was able to have him supervise me to get credit. And that was really the beginning of my agency, um, because while all of my classmates were interviewing for either um, law firm jobs or government positions, because the law school was in Washington, D.C., I thought to myself, hey, you know, maybe I could do this for a living. So that's how it all began. <laughs> well, you certainly have done it for a living. And uh, it, it, it's like it was made tailor-made for you. Uh, at least that's my impression outside looking in. So. I, I've always enjoyed reading and writing. Even as a student, if I was given a choice between taking an exam or writing a paper, I always pick the paper because for me that was always an easy A. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I loved essay exams and most people hate them. Um, so I love that your book is more memoir than biography. You're very much present. You're as present as Helen in almost every scene. It allows us to see not only you, but her in all of her dimensions and to concentrate on her her, her whole holistic humanity is what I call it. Like it, you see different facets of her. Um, did you decide to write the book as memoir from the beginning? No, that's actually not what I set out to do. What I set out to do, um, which I hopefully accomplished at least somewhat, was to show people the personal side of Helen that not everybody knew about. You and and inevitably, that was from my perspective. So to put things in context, that's why there's so much of me in the book. <laughs> but I loved it because you showed her personality by her interaction with you and others. It's not just about you, but I loved your presence in it. And there were lots of things that I think people would love about what it's like representing a famous person and what it's like representing someone you know so well. Um, and um, yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, you achieved what you set out to do. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the way, well, you're welcome. The day you deal with the way you deal with time and space is really impressive. Um, did it just flow, or did you have to have a lot of edits, a lot of revision? Well, it pretty much just flowed. What I did was I finally took my own advice that I give all my clients, and that was I started with a very broad outline, and then thought back and to see how things fit into that broad outline. So by the time I was actually doing the writing, it was fairly well organized. And I tended to group things together as I thought they belonged. Like there's a chapter on, you know, book tours. There's a chapter on speeches, et cetera. Um, there's even a chapter on Helen's favorite restaurant. <laughs> right. Um, right. That's one of the best ones. I love that one. I think DC people that live around DC, especially those of us who lived during the 80s and the 90s, we love that as much as anything else because it's about home. All the places that used to be or still are are renamed and we can- I, I still eat them. there regularly, well, pre-pandemic that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's an amazing restaurant. Uh, it's Mama Aisha's. So, on Calvert for any DC people. And if you're a DC person, you know it. Um, it used to be Calvert Cafe and that's how I used to know it when I used to go there. So um, I've told you, Diane, that Helen Thomas is a woman dear to my own heart, not because she was a forerunner who paved the way for journalists who were women, which was almost non-existent back then in broadcast. Um, and frankly, I started on a news desk and that was considered rare. Um, they were relegated to feature writing. Um, I interviewed her my freshman year of college and she was so kind to me. 
uh, her advice guided me and my career path. And I can only imagine how special your relationship was in terms of both um, her, her compassionate caring uh, of some of the people she loved and also how she mentored you. Um, do you have any stories about that? Well, I'd say that my biggest overall takeaway in terms of advice that Helen gave me was that she showed me that if a door is closed, walk through it anyway. Um, and that basically <laughs> gave me confidence to do hopefully good things with my life. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. So I think that is a huge lesson and a lot of people are, don't get over their fear enough to walk through those closed doors. Um, persistence and not giving up resilience, I think is so much part of any career, but especially a career in entertainment or journalism. Mm -hmm. um, your book contains story after story like these memories after memories. Uh, which do you treasure the most? Would you like to tell a story that's dear to your heart? Well, I think that I didn't write about those occasions that were dearest to me in the end. Um, looking back, Helen was the type of person that never wanted the party to end. So we were together, I'd say, five out of seven evenings a week. And always after we were done with whatever the activity was, she used to come over to have a cup of coffee or an after-dinner drink, and those were such good conversations in the wee hours of the morning sometimes. Um, I don't know how she did it because she used to set, you know, like five alarms to make sure she got up on time. Um, she used to get into the White House usually by 5 a.m., and but somehow she just didn't want to miss anything and those conversations were about solving the world's problems or something on the personal side mm. um so i was surprised at how much courage she had at the end um, she suffered from the same disease that killed my dad and in much the same way i I know her cause of death at the end was different, but um, it, it took courage and it, it, it must have been very difficult to watch because she was such a dynamic go-getter and yet she continued anyway. And uh, I love that about her. Again, a door closed and she walked through it. Um, how did it feel to dig that deep? Or did it you It was emotional. Dig? Um, very emotional at times, um, both the good things and the not so good things. Um, but I actually felt that my emotions helped the writing flow. Mm. I think that's true overall, especially if something that is nonfiction. Uh, I really don't like to read a book that doesn't have any emotion at all in it, and you can tell if it doesn't. Um, just a straight biography isn't my cup of tea. So this is anything but full of humor and um, the real deal. So let's switch just a little bit to today. Um, what do you think Helen would have to say about journalism right now? Would she approve of the commentary? Would she say there was objectivity? Or would she say that there's, that it needs more so? Um, I'd love what you think she would think. You well, I, I believe that she would not approve of opinion journalism unless it was labeled as such. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm sure you know, most of Helen's career was spent working for a wire service, UPI. Mm -hmm. And in those days, she used to say, just the facts, ma'am. And if my mother gives me a scoop, I'd check it with three or four sources. Um, so I don't think that she would necessarily approve of what's happened to these um, viewpoint shows and all. Um, right. Obviously, she was more liberal, 
Um, but I don't even think that she'd necessarily approve of MSNBC's approach to things, let alone Fox. <laughs> well, I, I'm totally in her camp. It drives me crazy sometimes how um, so much opinion is there. And I love just the facts and check your, your sor sources three or four times. Um, it's something that's missing today in so many areas. Um, and I hope that it returns and maybe it will. <laughs> um, what do you think she'd say about the current state of politics? Just to go, just to ask a provocative question. We don't have to dwell on it, but I'd love to know what you think she'd think or say. Well, she would be saying. Um, during the George W. Bush administration, she was at a social gathering with reporters but she thought she was off the record. So she commented that she thought George W. Bush was the worst president in history. And they wrote it. Um, but I believe that she'd probably have to revise her straight statement because I do not believe that she'd be fond of the current president that <laughs> occupies the Oval Office. I don't either. I can just see her in there. Um, I uh, I think though, even so, even though we all kind of knew how she leaned, she never made it uh, apparent in in when she was interviewing. Um, no, and that was intentional. Um, and she never told anybody how she voted, including me. But if you knew her for an hour, you knew her political leanings on a personal level. But mm -hmm. it never showed in her copy. Right. Um, so as you finished the book, you probably thought some about Helen's <clears throat> legacy, both for yourself and to the world. And what do you think her legacy is? Well, I hope she's remembered in history for the barriers that she broke down for women, and in particular women in journalism, because I see that as her primary legacy for the world. Well, she certainly did it for me in more ways than one. Um, I have her to thank for so much, and she probably, you know, it shows that the moments that we spend with people are valuable and how much we can do for someone if we mm -hmm. only just uh, open communication with them. She had such an open heart. Um, so, um, one more question and then we'll go to a few questions from the audience. Um, did Helen actually get her wish for her tombstone inscription? Do you know? It's no, she did not. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think she was saying that somewhat in jest. Um, but yeah. um, for the people who don't know what her wish was, she used to say that she wanted the word why to be the only word on her tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big why girl, so I love it. I love it. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to switch it over to Kaylee. Welcome back, Kaylee. And uh, do we, what questions do we have for Diane today? Hi, everybody. It's nice to be back. So uh, first things first, I would just like to say, Diane, it's such a pleasure to be able to listen and talk with you today because I was originally a journalism student and I remember Helen coming up in conversations in some of the preliminary classes I had. So it's really inspiring to get to talk to somebody that is so closely related to somebody that I learned about in school. So it's fascinating. Oh, wow. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. yeah. So um, we just have a few comments. So we have a hello from Kathleen Rogers. He says hello to Kathy and Diane. Um, and she says she loves your book, My Life with Helen. So that's from Kathleen. Well, um, um, and I'd also like to mention Kathleen is a client in the interest of full disclosure. Um, <laughs> but she has a fabulous book out now called The Flying Cutter Bucks. Amazing. She does. And everybody, I hope you watch my interview with Kathleen and buy her book. It's really selling like hotcakes and it's going to win awards. Um, 
And in full disclosure for me, I want to thank Kathleen for introducing Diane and me. I'd heard of Diane 9, but now I've gotten a chance to not only uh, have a, a conversation with her, and I hope to meet her someday, but to have her on my show. So, so thank I'll you. I'll take all. you to Mama Aisha's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to go. All of us, the three of us, the trio. That would and be great. We have a question from Tatiana Ramzoff. So she says, that was a very funny story of Helen Thomas and her stained dress. Makes her very human. Diane, what type of authors do you represent? Fiction, nonfiction, what genres? We do, um, we represent authors of all genres, but we don't do any academic books. So fiction, nonfiction, um, I always have believed that a good book is just a good book. Um, and, um, you know, we can't obviously take on everything that somebody submits to us. Um, in fact, I think that the evaluation process, if I'm honest, is a bit subjective. It sort of like reminds me of what the Supreme Court once said about obscenity. You know it when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> understood, understood. All right, we have one more question from Kathleen herself. Uh, she says, Diane, what is your typical day like in the life of an agent? Can you tell us about your agency's mascot? <laughs> um, she's talking about Daisy Cat. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, um, that's Daisy Cat is ever present, and Daisy Cat even has her own Twitter account. Um, she, she's a literary cat. Um, how appropriate. Um, so um, look for Daisy on Twitter. It's at DaisyCat9. <laughs> That's amazing. I fully support pets with social media accounts. <laughs> Daisy does too. <laughs> if only I could teach her to type herself. <laughs> one day, one day. So, so what's your typical day like? I'd say every day is a bit different. It just depends what's going on. Um, obviously, I do a lot of reading. Um, <laughs> and um, internally, we use track changes to make notes as we read things. And then we have a discussion about something before we even offer to talk to somebody. Um, and, um, you know, I spend a, an inordinate amount of time on the phone because of what I do for a living. There are a lot of calls with, obviously, clients and then a lot of calls with publishers. Um, the rest of my time I spend emailing and then I set some time aside for social media. <laughs> and pre-pandemic. Um, there are also a lot of in-person meetings, but those aren't happening right now. <laughs> right. Everything's on the web right now, isn't it? Um, yep. So um, on to the publishing industry. We've already segued there anyway. Uh, you've seen a lot of change in the last few deca decades of your career. Do you think it will continue changing and how? I sure have seen a lot of change. I've been doing this so long that email didn't even exist. Um, and I believe email is both a blessing and a curse. Um, but um, in all seriousness, it's mostly a blessing because that changed the way that agents are able to submit manuscripts to publishers. Um, in the olden days, before email, um, we used to have to physically bundle everything up and send it through an overnight service to the publisher. Mm. And nowadays, almost everything is done by email. That's the way we submit things. That the way, that's the way edits are sent back. Um, so email changed the world. Um, but I feel that technology has um, been responsible for the majority of changes in the industry. Some good, not, some not good. Um, it's changed both the way we buy books and how we read books. Um, the most obvious change in terms of how we buy books are the major online outlets. Um, 
and you know Amazon has become the largest seller a retailer of books in the entire world now and that's good and bad because for a while there it was putting brick and mortar indie stores pretty much out of business but the good news is that pre pandemic um, there were indie stores popping up again all over the country and the other way that um, technology has changed the way we read is through ebooks. Um, those have um, flattened now, um, but there's still a substantial portion of the sales of any book. In fact, I would be reticent to do to advise a client to sign a contract that didn't involve an ebook component nowadays. And finally, um, audiobooks. Um, those are on the upswing now. And from what I understand, the millennials are driving that surge. Um, and I guess um, from what I understand, it's because they like to multitask. So you can be listening to a book while you're cleaning your house or something along those lines. Really? Um, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> in, in fact, um, my book that were that was a topic earlier um, is there's going to be an audio book coming out um, mm -hmm. of my life with Helen. And... Um, it was sort of eerie um, because I've been listening to the chapters as the reader has completed them. And um, the day that I read the chapter about the last time I saw Helen when she was literally on her deathbed, right. um, I listened to that chapter on the anniversary of the exact day. Oh, I just that gives me chills. Yeah. Um, it, it immediately occurred to me as soon as I started listening to it. Um, but anyway, other changes in the industry on the not-so-good side is there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry, and that obviously leaves less and less places to go to get a book published. Um, but that seems to have evened out again now, and hopefully that remains the same. Oh, and good. then... I'd also like to comment on how the pandemic has immensely changed things um, in the book world, um, primarily about how authors can promote or not promote, as the case may be, their books. Um, but again, technology has a big role in the promotion of books, just as we're doing here. Um, everything has become virtual and um, you know, I'm doing a virtual event, um, I forget when it is, but coming up at um, the infamous Politics and Prose oh, Bookstore. Um, and that was initially scheduled to be an in-person event, but they've changed it to a virtual event. Um, and um, I don't know. <laughs> I'll still what? I'll still go, but... Um, <laughs> um, yeah, sign go. up for it. Um, I will. But, um, you know, other than these virtual events and virtual interviews, um, that leaves social media and all of my clients and myself included in this are, you know, hitting the social media hard. Um, Twitter is supposed to be number one in terms of promoting books, in terms of social media. So, you know... Um, I usually embrace change, um, but I don't like change um, forced upon me like the pandemic did. Um, yeah, but, you know, but, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, when we come out of this, the book world will be as strong as ever, if not stronger. I think that, that it's surviving quite well as opposed to other businesses. I, I'm worried about the indie bookstores, but... Right. That's all I really see. I mean, well, just, and then no. um, in the early days of the pandemic, um, Amazon was actually prioritizing orders. Mm -hmm. So at that time, it could take weeks to even get a book that you ordered off of Amazon. Right. So right. I think that yeah. part hurt the industry as well. It did, didn't it? Uh, so switching to authors themselves, uh, and I'm talking about career authors right now, the people that are still struggling nonetheless to get their name out there, 
um, not necessarily to hit the charts, but, you know, people that want to publish a book regularly. Um, if there was one thing or two things that you'd love to make them do, um, especially about marketing, but anything, any advice you have, what would it be? Well, I think during the pandemic, now's the time to be creative. Um, and certainly many people have a lot more time to do writing now than they did previously. Um, even if people used to go into an office, they had the commute time, um, some longer than others, but use that time to do some writing. And in terms of promotion, there's no good answer. Um, you know, um, social media, virtual interviews, virtual events, that's where it's at. <laughs> and it's working as far as I can see. People are really tuning in. So, mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. And do you have any advice to somebody who has a few books in their bottom drawer that need dusting off? Should, do you advise them to start all over? Um, do, or should they start sending to literary journals maybe? Or um, how would you advise them? Well, um, it depends upon the state of what they're dusting off. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, if it's very dated um, and it's set in current times, if it's a novel, um, maybe the language that's used or, again, the technological references that are in the book need to be updated. Nice. So I advise them to just go through their manuscript and tweak it. Right. Um, and then really um, the best way, and this isn't just because it's what I do for a living, um, but you, you have to find an agent if you want to be published by one of the bigger publishers in the world. Um, and there are a lot of ways to find agents. Um, there are listings online. I'm sure if you Google, um, agent listings will come up. My favorite site to find information on the literary world is called Publishers Marketplace. Right. And they list agents as well. Yeah. And if you do your homework, you can find an incredible list of agents that would be a good fit. And then you just start querying. Um, well, thank you for all that. Uh, do you have anything to add? And then I'd just like to know what's next for you and what's next for nine speakers. Um, well, in terms of what's next for me and my company, um, hopefully more of the same. Um, we're always <laughs> looking for the next breakout author. Um, we enjoy receiving submissions, and hopefully there's a gem in the pile of submissions that we do get. Well, there's usually a gem, but there, there, I know how many books you have to read to get to that gem. But um, I, I think it's the best of times and the worst of times for publishing, and I also think my advice to anybody I'm coaching is never, ever, ever give up. That's Winston Churchill after the, during World War II that said that. And uh, it's kind of my motto. Uh, and, and Helen would say, when the door is closed, walk through it, which doesn't mean you harass people at all. It just means that you find a way, you find a way around. Um, so thank you for this interview. It was my honor to meet you and to chat with you and to spend time with you. I know there's an incredible amount that you've offered today that's going to help a lot of people that watch this. Um, and I just want to end with, um, no, yeah, I'm going to show my, um, my teabag wisdom, which is a feature of my Facebook Lives. And I know you can't see it, Diane, so I'll read it first. And okay. it, it, these are always right. They really are. And I see it in you and I see it in Helen Thomas. From a small seed, because Helen was a very petite woman, a mighty trunk, I think you are too, a mighty trunk may grow. And that's what she did for the world and that's what you're doing for the world. 
and I'm showing it to everybody so they can see it. It's a quote from Aeschylus, and uh, again, uh, quite a literary quote. And uh, I, I so appreciate your being here. We're going to take a few final questions, and then uh, I will say goodbye. And um, everybody, uh, Diane is, is without a computer because of tech. And so I will be there to check your comments after. She has graciously agreed to um, answer anything I can't and by email, and then I'll post it later. So check back again if your question is, it doesn't get answered. So Kaylee, the floor is yours for now. All right, so Kathleen wants to congratulate you on the forthcoming audiobook, Diane. And she's also wondering, how do you struggle reading for work and reading for pleasure? Well, as you might imagine, I have very little time to read for pleasure because I'm, if I'm going to read, I always feel like I should be reading things that people are waiting for me to respond to. But with that said, I tend to read, I have a Kindle app on my iPad, and so I tend to read while I'm doing cardio. <laughs> um, I'm quite an anomaly in the gym I go to. <laughs> <laughs> And so. thank you for the congratulations. <laughs> awesome. That looks like that's all we have for now. Okay. So not a lot of questions. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to close, but people, please, now is your opportunity. Um, because if, if you don't do it live, the questions won't get answered. Don't be shy. Um, so, uh, I want to thank you again, Diane, for sharing oh, your, thank you. yourself and your wisdom and your stories about Helen Thomas, and um, you're quite welcome. I'm, it's such an honor, um, and uh, it, people are going to really get a lot from this, um, and uh, I, I wish you all the best, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to meet you myself. So bye for now. Uh, and uh, do you have anything final to say? Well, I just want to thank you for having me again. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and uh, I will uh, join you on Facebook, all, all you viewers, in a little bit. And uh, thank you again. And thank you again for watching. And you can find me at shoresofoursouls.com or groundonecoaching.com um, or here, right here on my Facebook page and on Twitter. Um, take care, everybody. Be safe and support others. Bye for now.